So, shocker, Disney released another animated film that has been received incredibly well. I've watched it myself, and I gotta say, it's great stuff, good characters, meaningful stories, I might have cried, but you didn't click on this to hear me trying to be a film critic, you clicked on this because you saw this. <laughs> and you and I both thought, wow, she's really, really lucky, and she can climb a lot of stairs. Now, I saw the scene, and when I heard the time it took for that stone to fall, I knew it was time to pull out my calculator. So, in this video, let's explore a few different things. 1. Just how high up is Mirabel when that rock falls? How tall is the inside of Bruno's tower? 2. How many stairs did Mirabel have to climb to get all the way up there? And 3. How long might that have taken her? And how much energy did it take to go all the way up and then all the way back down again? So, let's jump right into it. First things first, we need to accept that Mirabel is 5 foot 2, that is a height of 158 centimeters. Jared Bush, one of Encanto's directors and writers, confirmed this in a tweet last week, and just in time for me not to lose my mind trying to figure it out myself. Knowing Mirabel's height is not going to be immediately useful, but it'll be very important very soon. Now, topic 1, how tall is the inside of Bruno's tower? This can be determined with the help of your friend and mine, physics. As a matter of fact, let's take a look at one of the most elementary algebraic equations in physics, the free fall formula. This will let us use a basic understanding of gravitational forces to determine the distance that the rock fell. The free fall formula looks something like this. The delta x means change in position, in this case, the distance the rock fell. The g is the acceleration of gravity, and the t is time. Let's break this down further. In this case, we're solving for delta x. We don't need to know what it is, so let's set that aside. Now, we already know g from experiments by scientists on Earth. Gravity accelerates us downwards at 9.81 meters per second squared. As for t, time, it's pretty easy. We just need to measure the time between when the rock starts falling and when it hits the ground. I've measured this frame by frame and determined that it took the rock about 7.317 seconds to reach the ground. And that's it. When we plug in this information, we get our answer, 262.6 meters, which is about 863 feet. But there's a slight issue with this approach. That rock is going to have drag forces. Specifically, it's going to encounter some air resistance as it works its way down. Now, as a disclaimer, this is not a physics topic which I've really worked with, and let's just say that the equations get a lot scarier. But we're going to give it a shot anyway. Derivations of this equation aside, this formula is actually pretty straightforward when you break it down. With the help of a calculator and some basic algebra, this equation becomes, well, not so scary. Like last time, g is gravity, and t is time, so we already know a third of these variables. Another third of them are pretty straightforward. m is mass, that's how much the object weighs on a scale, and the a is the reference area which is almost like asking how big the face of the rock is that's pointing downwards. The last two variables are a bit more complicated and new, but nothing to worry about. C sub d is the drag coefficient, and this Greek symbol, which looks a lot like the letter p, is called rho, and represents the mass density of air and the fact that you should consider subscribing to the channel. Now, the mass density of air can be sorted out with a single search on Google or your engine of choice, so that's another variable solved. We're halfway there. Finding out an acceptable drag coefficient isn't that difficult either, thanks to a research paper I found on the drag coefficients of various volcanic rocks. And no, this is not how I thought I was going to be spending my winter break, but here we are. Sample 5 in the study is described as, quote, box-like and with, quote, intermediate texture. That's about as close a description of the falling rock in Encanto as we can get. And just like that, there's only two more variables left to determine, mass and reference area. For both of these, we're going to use Mirabel's height. Knowing that she's 158 centimeters tall, and I'm going to be using centimeters for this just because it's a little bit easier, the conversions to feet and inches will be on screen. We can compare her height to the sides of the rock and estimate the dimensions of the rock to be 284 centimeters by 118 centimeters by 390 centimeters. We can then determine an estimate for the volume of the rock by multiplying these figures together, giving us a clean volume of 13 cubic meters, or, should you so desire, 3,434 gallons of, well, rock. By finding out that the mass per unit volume of sandstone, which seems like a reasonable guess for what type of rock this is, 
is 2,323 kilograms per cubic meter, we can determine that the rock has a total mass of 30,199 kilograms, or 33.29 US tons. And just like that, we're down to one variable left. The last variable to solve for is deceptively complicated, but we're going to make some assumptions in the name of getting reasonably close without having to pull out our hair. We can see that the size of this downwards face of the rock equates to 3.35 square meters, but the rock is rotating on the way down. Thank you, Disney, and using Houdini for your rock simulations. The accuracy is nice, but when some nutcase on YouTube tries to determine the height of the tower in the movie, it, it just becomes a bit complicated. The face next to it, which is rotating towards, has an area of 11.05 square meters. Now, rather than trying to model the rotation of this rock, we're just going to assume that its reference area averages out roughly in the middle of these two figures, at 7.2 square meters. And just like that, we've got everything we need to solve this equation. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't solve the natural log of a hyperbolic cosine in my head. So after plugging this into a calculator, we'll find that the displacement of the rock and the height of Bruno's tower, at least up to where Mirabel climbs, is 260.2 meters, or about 853 and a half feet. That's just shy of one-sixth of a mile, so no, the thumbnail wasn't clickbait. I will confess that when I spent all the time I did on these calculations, I didn't think they'd be so darn close. That's a difference of less than 1%. However, I think this similarity could potentially help suggest that the new calculation, accounting for air resistance, is more accurate. But I digress. This isn't everything that we can squeeze out of this scene. We can also take a guess at just how many stairs Mirabel had to climb, and, believe it or not, we can figure out just how long it might have taken her to climb the tower, and how good of a workout it'd be for me or you. First order of business, we need to figure out just how tall these stairs are. Once again, knowing how tall Mirabel is comes in handy. So again, another thank you to Jared Bush for that clarifying tweet. After comparing her height to the height of the stairs shown in the movie, I found the average height of one step is about 0.224 meters, or 8.8 .8 inches. Perhaps a tiny bit on the steep side, but nothing too non-standard. By dividing the height that she has to climb by the height of the stairs, we can estimate that there were 1,161 steps standing between her and that very daring swing. A healthy individual should be able to climb about 56 stairs in a minute, that's about four flights. That means that it would take about 20 minutes and 44 seconds to climb Bruno's tower. Unless you're me, in which case it'd take about 20 hours and 44 minutes. Now, I'd also promise that we'd see whether this is a worthy workout. On average, walking up a single step would burn about 0.18 calories, and walking down that step would burn 0.05 calories. So, walking all the way up 1,161 steps and all the way back down again, would burn a grand total of 267 calories, which is approximately one small size McDonald's french fries. Last thing, because I know some of you are wondering, could I survive that kind of fall? On the one hand, a pilot once survived an insane 10,160 meter fall. That's almost 27 Empire State Buildings, 34 Eiffel Towers, or 85 Dublin Spires. For reference, Bruno's Tower is only about two Dublin Spires tall, a good bit shy of the Eiffel Tower, and a very good bit shy of the Empire State Building. However, after falling 260 feet, let's just say that odds are you're gonna need more than a few magical arepas from Julieta to heal you up. Thanks for watching, and please consider leaving a like and subscribing for more of this content if you enjoyed. See ya!